start the show. <laughs> right, so my name is Beth Mills, and I'm a specialist in glaciers. So I study glaciers, ice sheets in Antarctica, also in Greenland, some, part, some parts of the ancient ice sheets from Britain as well. And what I want to talk to you today is specifically about how climate change is changing the glaciers in Antarctica. Um, I'm going to run through, but if you have any questions, you know I'd really like this to be interactive, so if you do have questions, stop me and we'll, we'll have a discussion. That makes it much more interesting and exciting for everyone, I think. So do feel free to engage with me and ask some questions. Okay. So I'm going to start by outlining what Antarctica is, where it is, what it's like, and then I want to talk about some of my own work on the northern part of the Antarctic Peninsula. These are some pictures. I'm, I'm here in yellow. Okay, this is me. You can't tell from my mission, mission and that. Uh, and then why I do what I do. And it's largely so that I can try and understand the past and use that to yield insights into the future. And then we'll wrap up and then there'll be time for plenty of discussion and questions at the end as well. Okay, so this, this is Antarctica. And it's huge. You can fit the United States inside. It's the highest, driest, coldest, windiest place on Earth. It is about 3,000 meters above sea level. So you'd notice it when you fly in there. You'd notice it if you tried to walk up the flight stairs too quick. And it, it's a dynamic land. It's, it's got these mountain ranges. It's got these floating ice shelves. You've got these trans-Antarctic mountains separating out the East Antarctic ice sheet to the West Antarctic ice sheet. And the long spine of mountains projecting up back to the Antarctic Peninsula. There. But if you went there, if you went to the centre of the East Antarctic ice sheet, it would look like this. It's a flat, white desert. There's nothing there. There's no. You're 3,000 metres of ice. You're standing on 3,000 metres of ice. It is completely flat and featureless as far as the eye can see. You just got these little little features, these are these are wind scours, this is caused by the wind. There's nothing living there apart from some minor bacteria. All the activity in Antarctica takes place at the edge. So the edge is where the ice meets the ocean. And this is the grounding line. So here you have the ice meeting the ocean. And you have these floating continuations of glaciers that are called ice shelves. And they're carving icebergs into the ocean, and you're getting frozen seawater forming sea ice there. And it's in this ice-ocean interface that we're seeing some really rapid changes. We're seeing some really uh, dynamic and rapid uh, 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 recession going on here. And ice shelves, these floating continuations of the Antarctic ice sheet, they cover about 75% of the, the around 75% of the fringe of Antarctica. And they're collecting about 20% of the snowfall over 11% of Antarctica's area. So these are significant features. And in this grounding line here where the ice starts to float, where the buoyant ice starts to float, this is where we're seeing quite a lot of change. We're seeing recession, thinning, thinning of the ice shelf. If you took away the Antarctic ice sheet, you wouldn't see a flat feature as plain. What you would see is a land of mountains and valleys. So here you have the East Antarctic ice sheet, and you can see that these red areas, these are high. These are high mountains, bigger than the Alps. You've got the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, kind of similar in size maybe to the Andes, bigger than the Alpine Mountains. And then these big deep troughs, which are in blue. So West Antarctica, you've got this blue. These are areas where the, the surface of the land is well below sea level. So if you took away the ice, it would be a series of islands rather than a, rather than a continent. How did it get like that if it's had an ice sheet on it for most of its history? So that's a really interesting question. You've maybe heard about ice sheets being really erosive being really uh, effective agents of transporting material. It how effective ice sheets are depends quite a lot on how cold they are at the base. So ice sheets that are warm based, like what you might find in the Alps, are very effective at picking up rocks and moving them. Whereas some ice sheets, 
like in East Antarctica, are cold at the base. They're actually frozen at the bed. And these ice sheets are not very effective agents of erosion. They're moving very, very slowly, and they're not actually transporting a great deal of material. And in the Gambits of Mountains here, we can see, when we look under the ice using radar, we can see original geomorphological features such as rivers. So we don't see the river today, what we see is the, the kind of V-shaped river valley, the river dendritic drainage pattern, characteristic river patterns rather than kind of characteristic glacial features. So in some parts, you've still got these big, big mountains, and then in other parts, you've got areas of ground well below sea level. And then the Alps, the Alpine part, this mountain range is a focus for, for, for glaciers in the Antarctic Peninsula. Because the West Antarctic ice sheet is grounded below sea level, we consider it inherently unstable. It's not just a blob of ice passively flowing out to the edge. It's actually unstable because it gets deeper towards the centre. If I go back here, you can see that it's shallow here and it gets deeper towards <coughs> the centre. Do you see that? So you're getting deeper. Now ice flux, ice flux can be thought of as like a gate. So ice flux is the amount of ice that goes through a gate. Uh, you could count uh, flux of sheep going through a gate in the same way. Okay? The volume of sheep going through a gate per unit time is the flux of sheep. The volume of ice going through a gate per unit time is the ice flux. And ice flux is uh, a function of height. So H is ice thickness, and ice flux is a function of height. If your grounding line starts to recede backwards, H, ice thickness, increases. Ice flux increases. You get continued thinning, continued recession, and continued movement of the grounding line backwards. This grounding line, where the ice starts to float, cannot stabilize on a reverse bed slope. These retrograde bed slopes are fundamentally unstable, and this ice sheet will continue to retreat until it starts to meet uh, bed going up again. Could you please go through that again a little more slowly? Yeah, okay. So, are you with me on ice flux? Everyone's happy about the gate and the amount of ice going through the gate. If your gate is three dimensional and your gate is higher, you're going to get more ice flux going through it. Everyone happy with that? So, here you have ice of thickness one. If you move back to here, you have ice of thickness two. So your gate has increased in size, your ice flux will completely increase. Okay? Because it can't, and because, because this ice flux will increase, the ice flux will increase above and beyond the input of the ice. So your gain, your glacier is a function of ice coming in, and ice is going out through your gate there, yeah. So that it kind of, it would go back, but it would still be a shell. So yes, yeah, so the ground and line will retreat back, it will probably still end up in an ice shell. The ground and line will retreat back, and as, and as you see here, the ground line has retreated back, but you've still got a nice shelf here. But your ice thickness is greater here. So you've got delta x, which is your change in your x location of your grounding line. You've got delta h, which is h plus delta h. That's the change in thickness of your, of your ice. As you go back, ice thickness will increase. You'll still finish in a grounding line. Because ice flux is a function of ice thickness, you will have effectively what you will be doing is drawing down an ice sheet. And you'll be your ice will be flowing through that gate at a faster rate than it's being inputted from snowfall higher up. So this cannot stabilise and this will retreat back until it starts to meet the ground of the bed going up slope again. So if you think here, this is going to retreat from here, which is where it currently is, all the way back into the reaches those mountains. So yeah, if the ice is here, we'll go all the way back here. So the West Antarctic ice sheet is what we call a marine ice sheet, and we consider them to be unstable. One thing you might want to think about is the British ice sheet. This has got a map of Britain very helpful here. You've got all this land offshore. This was a marine ice sheet. Studies of West Antarctica are good analogues for studies of uh, Great Britain, the last British ice sheet, and vice versa. We know what happened here. We can use that to estimate what might happen here in the future. Okay, move on to ice streams. So the Antarctic ice sheet is not something that is flowing at a uniform rate.
rate out to the edge. It's actually drained by corridors of ice. These are fast flowing ice streams and they have fingers that extend all the way up to the ice divide. You get convergent flow into these ice streams and the ice is focused and accelerates within these ice streams. And they're transporting about 90% of ice and sediment to the, to the ocean. So ice that falls in the centre of East Antarctica, about 90% of that eventually makes its way to the ocean through, ice, through these fast flowing ice streams. And you can see these ice shelves around the edge in bright red, they're flowing very quickly indeed because they're not have, they don't have any resistive stresses. Because they're floating, they don't have any friction, so they can flow faster. So about 90% of your ice is making, your, making its way to the, to the continental shelf through these ice streams. And it turns out that they're not stable features of the ice, of the ice sheet. In the cycle coast, around here, some of these ice streams are switching off. They've stopped flowing entirely. Other ice streams are accelerating. And uh, some of the ice streams are thinning and slowing down. So these ice streams are dynamic. And because they're, chained, because they're controlling the transport of most of the ice to the ice ocean edge, these change of dynamics are really important for the, for the characteristics of this East Antarctic ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet. And another interesting thing about Antarctica is that it has subglacial lakes at its base. Now, somebody asked an interesting question about why the ice sheet is more erosive. And what you might notice is around the Gambets of Mountains and in other parts of Antarctica, there are very few subglacial lakes. Whereas in the headwaters of the ice streams, you've got lots of subglacial lakes. And these subglacial lakes are formed in natural hollows under the ice. They're formed due to pressure melting from the ice above. Are you familiar with the concept of pressure melting? Has everybody been ice skating? So when you ice skate, you have a knife edge on your feet, don't you? And you have a lot of pressure. You have all your body weight on those little knife edges. So you exert more pressure under your feet. If anybody's ever stood on your toe or saw wearing stilettos, you'll understand that the pressure is higher with a smaller area. Yeah, so you're focusing all that pressure in a small area. And the ice melts under your ice skate and allows you to glide very effectively. Ice is very slippery when it's wet, isn't it? I've fallen over on the ice. So ice is slippery when it's wet. That's what happens when you that's what happens when you uh, when you go ice skating, and that's what's happening here. You've got 3,000 meters of ice, it's a lot of pressure. And you combine that with a bit of geothermal activity, you get excessive amounts of meltwater forming at its base. These, this meltwater tends to be focused in the headwaters of ice streams. And when these subglacial lakes drain and fill, we see these ice streams accelerate. The velocity, the ice velocity of these ice streams changes, these ice streams accelerate. So, subglacial lakes, we're still finding them. We've found uh, around 250, but we're finding more every year. And it seems that they're actually fundamental for the, controlling the dynamics of the, of the uh, so that's a summary overview of Antarctica, but it's changing. It's a dynamic environment and it's changing quite quickly. Surface air temperatures are rising. Uh, they've risen by about 3.7 degrees centigrade since 1950. The Antarctic Peninsula is a worldwide regional hotspot for global warming. It's warming six times the global average. You can see you've got all this red here, this is all warming. West Antarctica, the surface air temperatures are warming very quickly. Because it's warmer, because you're getting more surface <coughs> air temperature rises, we're seeing increases in, in, in snow melt. This is an ice core record from the northern Antarctic Peninsula. Okay? And this is 1,000 years ago to present. So 1,000 years ago at the far end of the graph, the present day at, the, at this end. Okay, this is 100 years ago. Yeah. And what you can see is air temperatures have been increasing slowly from about 600 years ago, but then we have a massive spike, and we are now warmer than we've been at any point in the last 1,000 years. And coincident with this big spike in air temperatures, we're getting a big increase in summer melt. So the snow is melting more. We're getting more melt. An increased ablation is the technical term for that. The snow is melting more. These changes in air
air temperature of changing the pressure gradients and the temperature gradients in the, summer, in the southern hemisphere. And as a result, we see an intensification and a polarwood, polarwood movement of the southern hemisphere westerlies. These winds are blowing faster and they're blowing harder and they are uh, causing this rapid warming around, the Ant around Antarctica. But they're not just doing that. These surface winds are also changing ocean circulation. And we're getting increased upwelling of relatively warm deep water, like circumpolar deep water. And this relatively warm water is now, for the first time, penetrating the continental shelf and is warming and melting the ground in line from below. So we're seeing increased ocean melt of ice shelves. If you read The Guardian this morning, you will have seen there was an article in The Guardian today talking about this very process. Your homework is to go and read it, okay? So it's free online. This circumpolar deep water is melting Larsen Sea ice shelf from below. It's melting all the other ice shelves from below. So we're getting increased basal melting of these ice shelves. So not only melting from above by snow melt increasing, they're melting from below because they're being melted by these relatively warm ocean currents like circumpolar deep water. We can quantify. Yes. Was the circumpolar current has that always been there? Is it? Circumpolar current has always been here, but it's now penetrating more deep, more onto the continental shelf edge. The winds are changing the ocean circulation pattern, so we're getting increased upwelling. It's not that we never had upwelling; we're getting more upwelling. So we have. We have records, you know, there are proxy records of circumpolar deep water going back hundreds of thousands of years. And we can say that these ocean currents are changing. They're anomalous compared with the long-term trend. So ice shelves are melting. So this is a map of Antarctica, and you've got all these little pie charts. And the black parts of the pie chart show a portion of ice melt lost by basal melting. And the hatched areas show the proportion of ice melted by carving icebergs into the ocean. And you can see that these ice shelves on the kind of uh, Pacific sector of the, of, the, of the Antarctic ice sheet are all dominated by basal melt. They may only be small, some of these are very small, but they actually contribute quite a significant majority of, base, of, of, of uh, the loss, the melting of Antarctica, it's occurring through a small number of these Antarctic ice shelves. So half the meltwater comes from just 10 small ice shelves in the southeast Pacific sector of Antarctica. Now, bang up to date science here. This is published a few weeks ago. And it's showing the circles, yeah, are showing the mass balance of Antarctica. Are you familiar with the term of mass balance? I often think about it like my, like my bank account. I have money coming in, so I have input to my bank account, and I have money going out, out of my bank account. If I've got more going in than out, then I have a negative bank account, and if I have more coming in than going out, I have a positive bank account. Okay, so same with these. If they're red, they have more going out than coming in. So where you have red circles, these ice shelves are losing mass. They are melting faster than they are receiving ice and snow. And we're again seeing it focused along these Pacific sector ice shelves. Is there any particular reason why it's based on the West Sheet? It's due to these patterns of warming. Yeah. Yeah. Wind circulation and ocean current. And that doesn't happen on these. So these patterns of winds are focusing. Uh, warming around this sector, and you're getting slight cooling around this sector. But is it also true to say that it's happening because the West Antarctic ice sheet is a marine ice sheet, and therefore it can be attacked by the circumpolar covenant resulting in basal melting, which doesn't happen on the other side? I think what you could say is that around the West Antarctic ice sheet you have some deep bathymetric troughs which are being exploited 
by the circumpolar deep water. Because you have deep bathymetric troughs on the continental shelf around West Antarctica, it's more accessible to circumpolar deep water, where it, which is not quite so much the case around here. So these, these deep bathymetric troughs, which were locations of ice streams during the last legacy maximum, are focusing meltwater in specific places. So we're getting increased surface melt due to increased atmospheric air temperatures. And that is resulting in surface meltwater ponding on, our, on the ice shelves. So they're getting freestanding water on the ice shelves. And this water can, these ice shelves are vulnerable because they're thinning. Because the ice shelves are thinning, when the water ponds on the ice surface, it melts downwards. You can practice this at home. You could, you could get a baking tray full of water and then put some, a freezer and then put some water on it and see what happens. But these, this water is melting downwards. And that's resulting in the catastrophic collapse of ice shelves around the Antarctic Peninsula. These ice shelves are disintegrating and breaking up in a matter of weeks. So over the last 30 years, we've seen sequential ice shelf collapse on a number of ice shelves, starting from Prince Gustav Ice Shelf in 1995 to the Larsen A, Larsen B, and in the Guardian today, they were saying that Larsen C, which is down here, is melting and thinning as well. We're seeing increased surface meltwater and increased thinning of Larsen C. So we've got Prince Gustav, Larsen A, Larsen B, Larsen C off the map. All of them are thinning, retreating.